about BZ Group, your enterprise. What is it that you're farming and how many hectares are you farming on? Okay, uh, BZ Group, it's a, it's a agri business um, that I started uh, around 2018. Uh, Welcome to the Farming Podcast. My name is Mbalin Walker, and thank you so much for supporting the Farming Podcast right here on the Private Property Channel. Today is episode 127, and we're shining the spotlight on youth in agriculture. We're engaging with youth in agriculture, and it's always great to speak to another young farmer within the agri sector. And I'm glad that this time around, it's a maize farmer. We don't really get a lot of maize farmers um, that we've interacted onto the show, especially in rural areas areas. Uh, particularly this maize farmer is from the Eastern Cape, which is well known for um, its arable land, its vast landscapes, and has a high and huge potential for agricultural production. But not a lot of youth are farming within the Eastern Cape, and not a lot of agri-activity is happening in the Eastern Cape uh, because of so many other infrastructural and economical challenges. But let's hear how this young farmer is really finding his foot uh, within the agriculture landscape and he's been farming since 2018 so four years in the, in the game and uh, it seems like he's just growing because um, he's farming quite a number of hectares within um, his farm and has more space to obviously cultivate his lands and I believe that he is a young person that has big dreams however you know let me not get too much into it but I really want you to hear his story and hear his journey and how he got to where he is today so if any questions for our guests please feel free to comment, like, share, and obviously subscribe to our Private Property YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, let's welcome Ubuntu Zenge Etwa from B Zeng Group. He's a young farmer based in the Eastern Cape, and let's engage with him today. Ubuntu, thank you so much for joining the show. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I can't complain. And your side? I'm doing good, thank you. I see you sitting in the car. Are you out in the fields? Um, how's the rain uh, been treating you for the past couple of weeks? Uh, look, sometimes we say the rain is a blessing, but uh, this see, this season the rain has been, I don't know what to call it, has been beyond just a blessing. It, it, it has been a challenge to us, uh, trouble, that's what I can say. But you, you weather is weather, nature is nature, but yeah, we just have to work with what we have. Yeah, because a lot of farmers have been experiencing um, quite heavy rainfalls between November and December and in the early parts of January. How do you overcome such challenges as a, as a, as, as a maize farmer I I within the Eastern Cape? Okay, basically, um, the, the biggest challenge with having uh, heavy rains is that you, you cannot uh, really cultivate the land when it rains. And what happens is that because we know that maize has got a, a period uh, of time that you can plant it. Uh, basically, in Eastern Cape, you can you cannot plant maize beyond 15 December around that period because well, you are late once you go beyond uh, 15 December. So with all this heavy rain mm. and so on, we just had to take a chance as farmers and farmers and, and plant in between the rains. And as most farmers that I, I I know they had trouble of not even planting at all. So that's basically what happened with this rain. It was just more than a blessing. We want rain, yes, but now with these heavy rains, it was just getting the field wet. And also with whatever we had planted at that time, for example, I also planted vegetable. Uh, three quarter of my vegetable was gone um, due to rain. We couldn't do any cultivation in time and so on, but it's, it's part of being a farmer. Anything can happen. Uh, and yeah. Uh, that you just have to work around it and just not lose hope. Yeah, definitely correct because uh, yeah, we have to overcome a lot of challenges and I think too much of a good thing becomes a problem and so too much of rain definitely becomes a problem. But tell us about Beezen Group, your enterprise. What is it that you're farming and how many hectares are you farming on? Okay, uh, Beezen Group, it's, um, it's an agri-business um, that I started uh, around 
of indication. Uh, this is uh, the time when I, I resigned from uh, my engineering work and then I uh, decided to go and relocate back to Eastern Cape, my home, home province. So as we all know that we, we leave Eastern Cape to go and find professional works at Gauteng, these big provinces. So when you relocate back to Eastern Cape, you need to, 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 to know what plan you have in mind and everything. And so because I come from a, a farming background, a farming family, then I decided to myself, you know what, I know how what farming takes. I grew up around farming business and I, I, I do have um, support and mentorship if I need it. So when I went back to Eastern Cape, that's when I decided, you know what, let me just go into farming. Uh, some people will say you must have passion about something. You don't really need to have passion about something to, to do it. You just need to have the also the support and the mentorship, which is it's one of the things that I got. And then I went back to, to, to Eastern Cape and then I started my doing my agribusiness, which is a business group. So uh, basically what we, we, we specialize in is, is maize, as, as you mentioned. And also we also do vegetable because maize is a seasonal um, uh, crop. And so vegetable is one of those um, crops that can be planted um, all, all season. So it does kind of keep the cash flow moving. And then maize is one of the uh, uh, crop that we specialize in because we can utilize a, a large hectare. And because our land is a, it's a non-irrigated land, so it makes it more preferable to, to go for maize uh, at, a, at a high mass uh, planting, plantation. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And so you said maize is, is what you're farming as well as crop. Let's go into the maize. Is it white maize or yellow maize? And how is the market around maize in uh, maize farming in Eastern Cape? Uh, do you find, you know, um, um, agricultural cooperations looking to buy maize from young farmers like yourself? Um, just tell us more also about just the market opportunities um, within the Eastern Cape province, specifically where you are around maize farming. Okay, um, look, there are uh, different, um, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to maize, especially if you're a, a young black person like me. Um, with uh, 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 kind of pre disadvantage to kind of history. Because what happens is that, um, uh, yes, I do uh, plant maize, and the maize that we plant is white maize. We do plant maize, we, do it, we plant it at a high uh, capacity. So we, um, I think the, we kind of go even 50 hectares and so on. And then during harvest, we have to get rid of this maize. And what happens during that harvest system, you find that maize prices is a bit low and we do not have the mm. yes we do not have the ability to, to store this maize and then uh, sell it at the later stage where maize prices are high so that's those are one of the challenges that we have we do not have silos they call it silos mm. where we can store drain uh, uh, drain or let me call it waste maize and then when prices mm. start to go up and then we can sell this maize and then we get a high revenue so those are the challenges that we have with farming with farming maize that we have to farm it, and during that harvest period, we have to sell it at a low price because during harvest, everyone is just selling maize, maize. So the prices are not determined by us farmers, but they're determined by demand and supply. And then you find that the prices of maize they drop. To to some point, you can even you can even make a loss out, out of it if let's say uh, everyone in the country is just supplying uh, a maize. So that is one of the challenges that we have. We do not have the capacity that the other commercial farmers or the, uh, the farmers, the farming industry that has been, for example, free state. I mean, free state, those farmers have been in the industry for long. They've got all the mm. infrastructure and everything. So if they, mm. if for example, they do their harvest, they can store it until um, the season of harvest is passed and then maize prices, they go up, then they start selling. We do not have that capacity. We do not have that advantages. So that's one of the challenges that we have to a point where now it also affects the revenue the agribusiness and so on. And we, we do not become competitive, competitive to these other world established uh, um, agriculture businesses and so on because of these uh, troubles.
Yeah, I understand. So give us an idea. So when you're saying that, you know, by the time you harvest, the maize prices are low. What is low in this instance? Um, and for example, what's the price that you would get for maize when you harvest versus the price that you would get had you had a silo or some place to store and sell at a high price? So like, how do those prices compare? And also, how are you staying alive, especially from a farming production considering the fact that fertilizer and fuel prices are, have drastically and are still increasing uh, month after month? Okay, basically, um, just to explain the, the price uh, influence. So what will happen um, uh, around about June, at the harvesting around about June, July. So what will happen during that time, uh, a, a 40 kg bag of maize would go down to 100 rands, for example. And then what will happen, um, okay, everyone is going to be selling. For example, we sell locally. We sell to local wholesalers and so on. And then down the line, come uh, August, September or October, November, and then we'll find the same 40 kg back and go up to 200 rand, even 250 back, uh, 250 mm. rand. So those who have stored in your sale, you can see now the prices even went more than 50% of the price during harvest. So those who are able to store their maize they, 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 they are able to generate more profit margin or uh, better revenue compared to us who are unable to, to store the maize and we have to get rid of it as soon as possible at that 100 rand uh, per, per bag, uh, per 40 kg bag to those who sell around November, December and so forth. Because around December, no one is, is harvesting uh, maize. So there's demand of maize, but lower supply. So which means it increases the price. So those are the, the margin difference that depends. And then again, uh, another thing that you have mentioned, which is really plays uh, influence in agriculture, is fuel prices. Um, during have, during um, uh, these times of, of, of planting and so on, prices, they go up. During festives, we know all know that prices, they just will go, you know, go up. And even during this year, the unfortunate thing was this also what's happening in Russia, it's affecting prices, fuel prices also affecting mm -hmm. us, that you'll find that you used to buy, a, uh, now we have to, in order to buy a thousand liter uh, uh, a bulk of diesel, the price has doubled and it makes farming costly. And then at the same time, when you sell this bag to, to your wholesaler, you cannot increase your price because now the wholesaler is going to be like, okay, I've got choice. I can go to whoever during that period of harvest. Whereas if it's December, they have no choice. They'll take their bag for 200 rand or 250. So that's another thing that influences, mm. uh, plays a big role. And then how do we keep alive? Uh, as I mentioned, one of the crops that we do is also vegetable. So vegetable keeps that cash flow. Because remember maize, you plant it uh, around October, November, December. And then you wait until it gets uh, um, ready and around about June, July, that's when you harvest, that's when you re realize your revenue comes in. And then again, you, you wait again. Uh, and then you, then there's cost. Cost is still going to be there. You have to keep the farm running. You have to pay laborers and so on and so on. But yeah, um, fortunately, there are other items that we use around the farm that keeps the business moving. Fantastic. And who are your partners, Buntu, within BZN Group that ensure that you are able to maximize your yield uh, per hectare and that are assisting you with crop production, understanding, um, um, you know, the, the, just the basics around maize farming? Like you said, you started in 2018, but, um, you know, did somebody take you through uh, uh, maize farming and crop production? Did they, did, they, did they hold your hand and show you the ropes and how this industry works? Or did you just learn, are you just a self-taught farmer? Um, over and above that, like who are the partners that have just assisted you in starting your farming enterprise to where you are today? Okay, um, the, just to answer the partnership part first, um, Sagra, and, and then I'll be even specific. In Sagra, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there's a official from Sagra named by Sabonga Mkidi, a very patient person. Um, so that's one of the people too, if I need assistance, if I need to ask how to do one, two, and three. And then there's also my father, <clears throat> who's also a, a farmer. So I go to him, 
ask questions, how to do one, two, and three. Why do I do this? Why do, uh, why I don't just jump into farming? Because remember, farming requires a lot of investment. Uh, farming requires a lot of money to, 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 to get it running. So now for me to just jump into farming and think, yeah, it's going to work and so on, it's to kind of be, be knowing the risk but not doing the mitigations properly. So that's how why I approach these people. So in terms of support and so on, they're not really holding my, my hands, but they, they're giving advice on, okay, if there's weed, weed is becoming a problem, they'll maybe say, try, try testing your soil. I go and test the soil. When I get the results, maybe they're going to tell me to go to one, two, and three, then I'll take it to one, two, and three. The results come, analyze the results with their assistance, and then they'll advise me further. And then another department that I shouldn't forget, government, um, rural development. Look, we always hear negative things about government, but again, I need to also mention this uh, here, that government does have a positive impact sometimes uh, towards our CS infrastructure and so on, also affects us. But again, there are other programs that are in place that do have a positive um, impact on us. So I do also visit their offices or they do visit the farm. And then they, they'll maybe, for example, um, they were on the farm and then they saw that we've got a weed issue and then they gave advice to T. maybe you should change the method of how to, uh, to, to, to do weed control and so on. So those are the, some of the support and mentorship that, that we get. Um, I, I can't recall your other question. Yes. So basically, I'm, I'm glad that you've mentioned those organizations, SACRA, Department of Agriculture, mm. um, assisting you with things like weed control and understanding, you know, um, how many seeds to put in a hectare, how to, how to grow that enterprise. So, yes, I think you did uh, answer it quite well. Tell me about the youth in your area, you know. Um, you're a young person farming for about four years now. Are there any other young individuals farming? And um, how are you, as, just as a farmer, in your own capacity, ensuring that you're inspiring young people to farm? And are there any, many, are there any, if, uh, if, in, are there any young people within your area that are also farming at the level in which you are farming, whether it be maize or, 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 or crop production? Okay, um, talking about the youth as a whole in, uh, in my area, um, mm -hmm. I, I'll say young people have given up. Uh, they've, they've given up. Yes. We talk about land. Yes, we talk about uh, resources. Yes, we talk about support not being there and so on. But uh, I feel like also as young people, we need to be go-getters. Uh, yes, I grew up in Tala. I left Tala because of job. They were finding job. And then I came back to Tala. So it's not like everything was given in a silver plate. So when I got here, I started to be a go-getter. Get the, the how do we get programs from government? How to join things? How to buy things online? Because that's another issue that um, when you buy um, inputs in in in, in our, around our retailers or you try to buy something that you're going to use in the farm, it's very expensive compared to buying it online, getting to Korea and so on. Because you understand it's a rural area, so everyone is going to try to make a markup. So mm. young people don't want to go through mm. that those challenges. They want to be given everything on the on, on the silver plate. Not all of them, but some of them, most of them. So that is one of the challenges that as young people are facing is that we want to get everything on the silver plate. To a point where now we find that farmers that exist around, um, let's talk about Taki Caesar because it's the municipality which Tala and Elliot falls under. Farmers that we okay. find under Saki Caesar in Eastern Cape, which is a rural area, a, 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 a major rural area, it's old people, uh, people who are above 60, uh, people who are in their retirement ages. And then you find that the young people that you find around here, they're a small number compared to these old people. And and when when uh, organizations such, such as NYDA they, mm. and, um, and, and rural development, they make these um, conferences where they call young people the only thing you will hear from young people wanting is 350 grand. We want 350 grand. We should also get uh, grand. We also grant, grant, grant left and right. So you can actually see that um, <laughs> it, it, we, we, it, there's no future for us young people, uh, you see. Yeah. Because again, yes, um, the, the guy from Sagra that I deal with is also a youth. 
uh, probably um, uh, almost uh, uh, older youth than me, and you you can you can literally see good here. if young people were were more focused, were more goal getters, we would we'd be far as young people in Eastern Cape. Um, we wouldn't be seeing so much unemployment. I'm not mm. saying it's a quick solution, but a farming, we've got the land. We've got, if you come and drive around Eastern Cape, you've got land in rural areas that are sleeping. I must say, when you call it in, in, in Kosa, they're just lying there. They need someone to work on it. And some people, they're going to talk about big tractors. You don't need a big tractor to, to get your, your, your land mm. planted. You don't need... Uh, a, a, a big implement or kind of a, a lot of mechanization to get your to get a land worked on and make a, a land durable. So us young people we are running away from that and to a point where even the guys who are on their retirement age now they 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 they're passing on, and now there's that gap where there's no knowledge passed on because us young people we want to relax at home and have a grantee or expert to work or spy and everything, but do not want to go and get our hands dirty. So that's the issue with young people. And again, young people shouldn't say that government doesn't have programs to support. There are a lot of programs. Yes, mm-hmm. they, 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 they don't do the work as fast as we want them to do. But again, we also need to, mm-hmm. to show interest. Then mm-hmm. they're going to start also to wake up and to say, hey, these people are on our heels. We need to start making things move. Yes. Oh, wow. That is fantastic, Buntu. And I can just definitely feel the energy and the passion that you have for agriculture. Congratulations for starting Bees and Group. Congratulations for farming 50 hectares of maize and adding that with a crop and seeing the need to diversify crops because business has to continue um, and understanding that these are seasonal crops. And if you know you are in your downturn, you do need a substitution, a substitute crop, um, you know, to just add in terms of uh, building your business from a revenue your point of view. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and sharing your experience, your, your journey with us, and obviously highlighting the positives that government also does, because it's very rare that we always get positive feedback around government. It's always around um, people just uh, uh, expressing their dissatisfaction. But, uh, you know, thank you for sharing your journey um, in a, such an honest and open way. And it's great to see that as a young person, you are being supported, and that even though you are being supported, you're not heavily really reliant on those structures, but you're using your own innate passion and skill and expertise and, you know, trial and area, trial and error um, 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 learnings to obviously grow um, yourself as a farmer. Continue to doing amazing work and continue to inspire young people uh, within your nearby community and within your province. Thank you for some, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Thanks very much for the interview. And I uh, hope people are going to take some pointers from this uh, interview. Absolutely. Yeah, we need to, yeah. yeah, as young people, we need to make changes. We are the next uh, next generation that will take this country forward. So Absolutely. I couldn't agree much. more. That was Bundu from Bizeng Group. He's a young farmer based in the Eastern Cape, um, farming maize as well as crops. Um, he just shared his journey based on how he quit his job as an engineer, started farming in 2018, and um, now he's farming yellow, uh, sorry, white maize, I, I presume, and other crops just to substitute um, where his maize is off season. So he's growing his enterprise steadily, and um, he also shared his experience around working together with other organizations partnerships um, and shared um, some some insights in terms of how young people can look at opportunities. There are many organizations out there, government um, uh, agencies, private-owned agencies who really want to support farmers, uh, leaning on to other young extension officers who've got knowledge, who can share some skill in how you can improve yourself as a farmer. If Buntu's story doesn't inspire you, then I don't know what will. However, it just shows the many opportunities that exist in farming, the many different farmers and the types of farmers that we have within South Africa, more so that indeed we do have young farmers who are passionate about the sector. Thank you so much, and I hope you found this conversation quite insightful um, and inspiring because I def- definitely did. I will see you next time on another episode of the Private Property Farming Podcast. Continue to like, share, and subscribe um, to our YouTube channel and follow all the other podcast episodes that we have. Um, the next one will be a hun- uh, 100, episode 128, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. And please feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any questions or suggestions for the show. 
Take care.